Hello, I'm Doug, stand-up physicist. Claims on the internet live on indefinitely. I claim to have found a way to unify gravity with the other three known forces of nature. Thanks to sometimes uh, trying efforts on the blog science20.com, I now have reasons to think that that claim was in error. And I consider it my responsibility to unambiguously rescind the claim. If in the future someone starts rehashing my work, well, at least I can provide a line of defense. I avoided the word retracted because that is used in scientific journals when the editors figure out that the uh, author was creating fiction instead of using fact. Rescind is being used in the sense of repeal. I am no longer going around promoting gem unification proposal um, because it's wrong. Rescinding work is not part of the culture of science. Work on, like, supersymmetry may someday be ignored, but not rescinded. Data from the Large Hadron Collider, uh, the LHC, continues to cast data-driven doubts on the existence of supersymmetric particles. Now, the published papers on supersymmetry passed peer review, and that's good enough. <laughs> We really just lack a device to say, well, nice try, uh, but the data says it ain't so. You know, the only real mechanism we have in science culture is the dustbin of history. So let me be very specific about what I am rescinding. It's essentially the field equations at, on the front of this t-shirt or this t-shirt, <laughs> and it is the Lagrangian on the back there. That is specifically what I am taking back. All right, so I'm making this YouTube video, which I'm going to actually link to a bunch of other videos where I talked about this proposal. And I am going to go to make a talk at the Fall 2012 uh, American Physical Society meeting in Williams College. Um, and I'm going to, at Science 2.0, put up a blog and have a whole bunch of links. And it's just my responsibility, uh, but it's totally not a fun <laughs> thing uh, to do. I mean, I am proud of the fact, of the fact that this proposal was so specific it could be written on a t-shirt and also uh, shown to be, well, wrong. A proposal needs but one fault to be wrong. Uh, the gem unification proposal had several problems um, and a lot of them were actually committed by this thing called the hyper complex product a move away from quaternions, which happens to be my specialty. Kepler's old equal area swept out in an equal amount of time for planetary motion. Worked out, what, 300 years ago, 400, whatever, some long time ago. Is actually uh, understood today to be saying that angular momentum is conserved for gravitational systems. A Lagrangian, that thing on the back of the t-shirt, is actually every way that energy can be traded inside of a box. Now, if one can spot a symmetry in the Lagrangian, then that symmetry is necessarily linked to a conserved quantity. To conserve angular momentum, one must be able to rotate that Lagrangian in space 
and show that the result is not changed. And that leads directly to angular momentum conservation. Now there are two current coupling terms in the GEM unification proposal. One has the quaternion product and the other has this hypercomplex product known as that little box times symbol. In a rotation, the phi and rho are unchanged. The dot product is the cosine of the angle between the two three vectors times the magnitude of those two three vectors. Now the angle between those two, well that's not going to change if we rotate our reference frame and neither is the magnitude of the of the two vectors. So there really is no problem with rotation for either current coupling terms. And they actually are exactly the same, so <laughs> I'm glad nature is so consistent. That's a good thing. It is the contraction of the field strength tensor that causes the problem with angular momentum conservation. And so we can calculate what that contraction is. And we have these four terms. Well, three out of the four terms are invariant under rotation. The first and the fourth term uh, behave just like polar vectors that happen to point in different directions due to the sign of that gradient of phi term. But the dot product uh, will square the magnitude of these two vectors times the, that cosine between them. And, you know, uh, which actually, since it's the same thing, there is no angle. Um, and that ends up being, you know, one. Um, you know, and, it, and it'll be just it'll be just fine under rotation, or not fine, I should say, invariant. You know, it sounds so much more sophisticated. Here we go. So, uh, it actually does take more work to see that the dot product of the curl uh, with itself is invariant under rotation. Now, if this were like a cross product, not a curl, then one would say the cross product uh, is the area formed from making a parallelogram. Let's see, well, how, can I do that with my fingers? Eh, something like that. Uh, uh, my fingers aren't shaped quite right. All right, but you, you basically form a parallelogram that has an area that's equal to the cross product. And that, by the way, is why if you're pointed in the same way, it, it, it goes to zero. Good thing to know. Uh, the, so, um, now the area... So, so you think about the area. What would the area be if we rotated coordinates? Oh, it'd be the same. They'd be unchanged. Um, so the now and the area is not changed. We take the dot product of that area with itself. We get the same value. So that's roughly speaking uh, why it works out. So um, you can actually work this out symbolically using uh, quaternions. Uh, a rotation involves, with quaternions, uh, pre and pro post multiplying a quaternion uh, by a unit quaternion, which means its norm is equal to one. So you can rotate out the parts and uh, that go into a curl, and you notice that you've got a u times a u inverse right in the middle, so they kind of bow out, and the curl is only the anti-symmetric part of a quaternion product and so you just form that dot product and you say well this really is the, uh, the norm of, of, of a three vector sort of thing and uh, quaternions are a normed division algebra. What that means is that the norm of a product is uh, can be calculated by taking the norms of each part of it and then multiplying that out. And so if you're using all these unit uh, quaternions, which have a norm of one, hey, multiplying by one doesn't change anything. So uh, that at least is symbolically how you can argue uh, this kind of position. And believe me, this is just like really old, old, well-known result that uh, the dot product of the curl is invariant uh, under a spatial rotation. 
So now we consider the symmetric curl, that final, that final player in this little story. Hyper complex numbers do not form a division algebra. Mm. More germane to this particular discussion is that hyper complex numbers do not form a normed algebra. So why is that? Well, with all these positive signs that are in a hyper complex number, it's basically the rules of uh, quaternions uh, for multiplication, except there are not, there's not a single minus sign in the house. It's all super positive. I sometimes refer to it as, as the California algebra. It's so, uh, so, 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 so sunny. So um, it's just not possible to pack all the values present in one real number slot like happens with uh, the norm of, of a quaternion. For a quaternion, if you know quaternion equals a b, or b being a three vector, then its norm is a squared plus b squared zero zero zero. That's the key thing: is that all the values get put in one slot. Um, a, with hyper complex numbers, you can generate that first term, the a squared plus, uh, plus b dot b, but uh, there's just no way to cancel out all the other ones. And that is really a central property of a norm, is that it collects all the values into one place. Hypercomplex numbers are just going to be painful to work with. <laughs> now, uh, one simple approach to uh, dealing with this is to just work with plain old numbers and see how those numbers uh, behave. Now, um, you know, symbols really are just an abstraction of numbers. So, uh, if you choose a randomly, uh, if, if you make a random choice for a number, it's really just a concrete example of the abstraction. A number of years ago, I actually wrote a program in C so I could play with quaternions at the command line and also hyper complex numbers. Now, if you are familiar with the command line, um, then this is kind of an odd way of really showing the product of uh, cross product with itself is in fact invariant under a boost. So what I do there is I take this qx odd, which is a function to calculate the uh, cross product, and I put in two quaternions and I pipe it into a function called q square. And as you can see, you end up with minus 117. All right, now I do a rotation of a quaternion, and that involves pre-multiplying by a normalized quaternion, and then post-multiplying it by another quaternion, and then I store that value. And I do the same thing uh, to that other quaternion, and then I take those two products, um, form the, uh, the um, the product of those two, take the square, and I end up with 1.6, Okay, that's a little bit of rounding error. Uh, no big deal. Uh, it just shows the limitation of uh, the tool that I happen to be using. So now we do the same calculation, but with the hyper complex product. So I take my symmetric cross product, and I take its square, and I end up with a number, oh, then there are those non-zero other values. So it, it, I, I can't say I've taken the norm, that, that, that's not a norm. But I do have these rotated quaternions and I rotate those and uh, that's just not the same. So the first terms are different. Uh, it, basically, a, a rotation changes the result. A symmetric cross product, um, you know, just changes under rotation. It's just that simple. Uh, you know, you might say, well, yes, but that's the cross product, not the curl. But I think this all is really a reflection of the underlying algebra. And while I could invest uh, time figuring out how to do this for the curl, you know, since the underlying uh, hypercomplex numbers uh, creates the problem, you know, it's, you know, the, the problem's just not going to go away. So in poker, you just got to know when to fold them. So because the square of a symmetric curl is not invariant under a rotation, 
uh, angular momentum is not conserved, and that is a deal breaker. Gauge symmetry is another important part of my proposal. Why? Well, in EM, there is this U1 gauge symmetry, uh, where, which leads directly to uh, electric charge conservation. Electric charge conservation has been shown to an absurdly uh, high degree of accuracy. In the GEM proposal, uh, for the gravity part, there would need to be a similar sort of gauge symmetry for mass charge conservation. Once again, it is this uh, <clears throat> hyper um, complex numbers and this, this symmetric curl that creates the problem. So here is the uh, electromagnetism uh, magnetic field, all this anti-symmetric stuff, and we do a gauge transformation. We actually add in another term in here, carefully chosen, I should say, uh, and when we do that, we go, oh, look at that, it cancels out. Isn't that nice? Well, if we repeat the process, um, but as I say, replace all minus signs with plus signs, well, we are not gonna get the cancellation going on there. Uh, the symmetric B field is just not going to be invariant under a gauge transformation. And so in my interpretation of the proposal, that would mean that mass is not conserved. Hmm. Now that is a deal breaker for me. Now I want to mark the next little uh, bit as kind of a more speculative reason for rescinding the proposal. But it was a mo well, somewhat motivating reason to say, I don't think this is going to pan out. The GEM unification proposal would probably be resistant to being quantized. One key step in quantization is to take the <clears throat> set of field equations and invert those field equations to generate propagators of for the quanta in the field. Uh, and that usually requires picking a gauge. The propagator is then used in perturbation calculations uh, in quantum field theory. One of the most powerful properties in quaternions is that they are a division algebra. Imagine one has a set of field equations formed by taking the operators and forming the necessary products using the quaternion division algebra. It would then be the case that the field equations could be inverted. Now, one would still need to pick a gauge for a gauge invariant uh, field theory to do a calculation. But knowing that there is an inverse that exists strikes me as a really strong foundation for quantum field theory. Note that I've never actually read anybody with credentials who says that, but, you know, um, I, so I, I got to admit that maybe that's not an important property, uh, but nobody else really is working with quaternions, so it's, it's kind of like a, 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 an issue they wouldn't explore. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, I'm thinking that forming the field equations would, uh, with a division algebra would be a good thing. Now, what they do do is do field equations over a division algebra, usually the complex numbers. And I'm just shifting the discussion to thinking about forming the field equations themselves uh, with the division algebra. And I probably will never have the math chops uh, to establish any advantage of using uh, four division algebra to form uh, the field equations. I'm, that's pretty technical stuff. Uh, so the GEM unification proposal uses both quaternions rock on, division algebra, and hypercomplex, rock off. <laughs> so the hypercomplex numbers uh, are, are not going to be uh, very friendly to forming propagators of, uh, of the field quanta. Um, and so I, I suspect it, it wouldn't work out. Don't know it, but um, 
I'm not hopeful. Right, this very t-shirt, it says, mm, no, let's see, let me read it. The stand-up physicist said, some of the other equations, and there was light, gravity, radiation, a nucleus, but no stinking Higgs. Mm. Okay. So, there certainly is a new particle at 106, 126 GeV. Um, that was determined um, at the LHC. There is a much to learn about that new particle. We need to establish that its spin is zero based on data, not on our own expectations. Uh, the channels that actually have that information are hard for each, even the LHC to collect. It's going to take them years to get it, because uh, it could be spin two, for example, which would really not be the Higgs. <laughs> um, and I also don't know how the heck they're going to tell the difference between a z spin zero Higgs and some other sort of composite particle. Now, my own reservations about the Higgs particle discovery are actually immaterial uh, to this particular uh, blog about my uh, rescinding the GEM proposal. It, <clears throat> in the GEM pr proposal, there was this really cute uh, cancellation of terms from the gravity part with the part for EM and, uh, uh, and the weak and strong force, or I should say my hope for the weak and strong force. It was really just so cute uh, that I was hoping that it would provide an algebraic reason why inertial mass is exactly equal to gravitational mass. Uh, because that's a central assertion uh, used to form general relativity. It'd be nice to have a little algebra that said, yeah, that's spot on. Uh, but there was never really a link uh, to providing mass specifically for the W or the Z particle. In this claim, there was basically not enough there there. One of the ex early experimental conservations of general relativity was that light bend around the sun about twice of what Newt Newton predicts. And the GEM unification proposal um, they had this exponential metric as a solution to the field equations, which I thought was really pretty slick. Um, and that is consistent with that data. And more than that, it says that if we go to the next level of precision, that there should be 12% more uh, bending of light than general relativity itself predicts. Now, no tests at that resolution of micro arc seconds are even planned. Now, as a force equation, the GEM proposal gets the static solution right. Now, since there's more than one term to the GEM proposal, um, well, it could be it's got the capacity to get the force equation bending uh, right. Uh, it's just at this time I didn't figure out how to do that. Now, that's <laughs> probably a limitation of, of on me uh, or it could be that it would get the an answer wrong uh, at this point I don't know and the bottom line is that a c consistent proposal must be able to get the same result in the force form and I haven't done that so what's my future uh, directions of research well I do still believe that a rank two field equations for general relativity will re be replaced someday by a rank one field proposal akin to uh, Maxwell's equations. Mm. Now that's a personal belief, okay? And so I don't ask you, the listening audience, to share that article of faith, uh, but that is my research direction. There are speculative alternatives to what's written on this t-shirt. I mean, one could imagine that for, you know, classical gravitational systems, that symmetric B field is so absurdly small that it really can be ignored. And since that was 
key to several of my problems that was like, oh, classically, I don't have a problem. Now, a different proposal could also claim that breaking of those symmetries, particularly the gauge symmetry, is not a bug, but darn, gosh darn it, it's a feature. <laughs> now, I'm going to investigate um, those and other possibilities, because who knows? Um, I really don't know if they're going to pan out. Uh, I actually expect that none will. Uh, most of my limited uh, free time um, is actually being used these days uh, on a software project uh, for analytic animations that I can hopefully uh, be able to run on my phone someday. Uh, that'll take a year or two. Um, and it's going to be basically years before I might uh, formulate a new proposal. But as I've previously stated, if I do come up with a new proposal, it's got to do some things. Specifically, it's got to have rotational symmetry uh, to conserve angular momentum and be consistent with good old Kepler's laws. It's got to have a gauge symmetry so that it can conserve mass. It has to have a metric solution and it has to have force equations whose static solutions are equivalent to uh, the Newtonian theory uh, but whose dynamic force is twice of Newton's. And it must also have a symmetric math program to really back up all those claims. Now, should, should anybody actually offer a variation on JAM, the, the, the unification proposal, you know, I would need all of those same criteria met, including the Mathematica, Maple, Sage, whatever supporting notebook. So I do need to thank the critics uh, of this proposal on Science 2.0. Uh, it was a tough relationship in, in a lot of cases. And at this, uh, this great a distance uh, from that time, you know, I just take home the bottom line, which is to rescind the proposal and do the work uh, to make sure that um, this rescinding of the proposal uh, is easy to find. Um, you know, basically the, the dustbin of history is, is calling. Thank you very much.